Thanks for asking me to talk to you. I um, feel slightly daunted with this audience. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, change at the level above the clinical microsystem, um, uh, partly because I reckon that you're more expert in that, uh, the microsystem, and, and than I certainly am. Um, and quite a lot of this is based on work that I've been doing over the last few years uh, with people who've been doing integrated care. So quite a lot of the thinking here is, is about integration, but it's not exclusively uh, that. And I'm going to focus a bit on why things haven't worked, because um, first of all, we can learn a lot from uh, from, from that, but, but actually there is a, a very familiar pattern which I'm sure that you're all used to, which is um, we've, we've often got quite a good diagnosis of the problem. In fact, at the sort of strategic level, we've often had different consulting companies come along and produce multiple versions of the same story over the years, um, and then people try and solve it, and then you start the before you've even begun the implementation, something else comes along, or you restart the process. Um, very interesting, in Wales, uh, people blame a lack of clinical engagement for their multiple failures to reform parts of their health system. It actually, when you look closely, it's the other way around. The clinicians have given up on anyone's ability to make change happen. It's an interesting and recurring pattern that we see in, uh, in, in many systems. Uh, uh, in, in business, there's a, a, an acronym which uh, sums this up. It's called BOHICA, and it stands for Bend Over, Here It Comes Again. Um, <laughs> So let's go through a few of the things that don't work terribly well. So the first is, well, first of all, is framing the whole idea about what we're going to do uh, for, for service change. And I'm afraid to say I, I see rather too much um, hunch, anecdote. Oh, we've seen a few patients with falls. Let's have a falls clinic, put it at its, at its worst. Um, and, and, and sometimes some um, pretty ropey diagnosis of actually what the problem is. Here's an example. If you open your GP surgeries 8 till 8, this will reduce A&E attendance. A, that's a hypothesis-based piece of policy. Uh, um, the actual problem is probably same-day uh, same appointments, not extended hours. The problem is that the people who came up with that policy, in common with most of the people who design policy, are middle-aged men who commute. Um, and so they conceptualise the problem as, I can't get an appointment, that must be the problem. I'm probably being a bit unfair on them. Possibly not. Um, so, f first problem, incomplete uh, diagnosis, hunch, anecdote. Um, a second one is measuring activity rather than actually what the true demand is. Um, of course, that's really very difficult. I asked a colleague of mine the other day if we could try and quantify what the use of, uh, of uh, intensive care was by acute medicine, and her response, well, it just depends how many beds there are. Uh, we have not got a, a very good definition of demand for many of our services, which makes it quite hard to work out what you should do. So here's another example. Uh, we thought that if you opened lots of, well, I didn't think this, but policymakers thought if you opened lots of minor injury units and walk-in centres, it will again reduce demand on A&E. Does anyone, anyone notice that recently in their A&E departments? Um, in fact, what it seems to have done uh, has proved the, uh, the, the well-known Roma's Law uh, from JAMA in the 1960s, which uh, uh, I will summarise with the phrase, if you build it, they will come. Um, uh, we've increased the use of, of uh, A&E and walk-in type services without having any impact on type 1 A&E uh, departments at all. Um, that's because we didn't really understand the nature of demand. Uh, a worse one is mistaking uh, activity for value. Um, so we do things because we can do them rather than because they necessarily add value to the patient. And I'll come back to this, uh, this theme uh, a few times given the, uh, the, theme, uh, the theme for today. But the, you know, the classic story is uh, we gave the patient a hip replacement when what they really needed was a handrail. Uh, because we could, do a hand, we could do a hip replacement, but handrail is very difficult to organise. I'm exaggerating, but I'm sure you'll, you'll see lots of examples where people are doing workarounds um, to, to, to problem with the solution they've got, the old, um, if you have a hammer, every problem's a nail issue. But so, so we're doing things, we're doing things, but we're not necessarily adding value. So when we're framing the, uh, the, the idea for our service change, the, the question you have to keep coming back to is, what, does, what would really add value to the patient? And we'll come, we'll come back to that. Um, just a, a, a slight diversion here to talk about context. Um, one of the things that drives policymakers absolutely mad is the NHS saying, well, we, you know, they did that in Swindon, so it won't work in Oxford. Um, or you know, they did it in Hammersmith, so it can't work in Ealing. Um, uh, and there is, I think, a legitimate view that uh, the NHS tends to claim exceptionalism uh, for its particular area, when it, which is not legitimate. Um, but on the other hand, the policymakers completely ignore the importance of context, and context uh, uh, does matter. 
and it particularly matters if you are copying someone else's, uh, some, someone else's uh, in, innovation. Um, the, uh, uh, the, the receptive context for the service model really does matter, and, and having a rich understanding of that and how that works is something that we often neglect, uh, but is, re is really important. And, and that's when we're copying, that becomes even more important because the key thing for copying is, and this is where we again often go wrong, is failing to actually really understand what's the active ingredient in the service model that we're copying that really makes it work. Um, I, uh, many, many years ago, was, uh, when I was at the School of Hygiene, we evaluated a number of hospital home schemes, and the the main finding I think we found was there was a particular woman that if you let her run this scheme it would work. That was the basic, um, she could, however badly you designed it, she could probably make it work. And there were other people that you gave them the perfect model, it was never going to work. So uh, as a generalizable research, I've forgotten her name now, but as a generalizable research finding, discovering that one uh, a, a senior nurse is really good at managing hospital at home schemes is of limited generalizable use, I think you'll agree. So, uh, but, but, um, but it does mean that you may be mistaken taking the active ingredient. You might think it's the physiology, you know, it's the anatomy of the scheme that you're looking at that, that makes it work, but it's really the physiology. It's some, some elements of the internal processes. Um, and then there's a, a, a final thing here. We could go on with this list. I'm sure you've all got your own things you might want to add on to it, and we might ask you that later. But uh, uh, being clear what we actually mean. Um, uh, does anyone got any idea how many definitions there are of integration in the literature? Anyone like to guess a number? Sorry? 100? Higher? Lower? Higher? Higher. 130. I'm told by Nick Goodwin, who studies these things at the International Federation of Integrated Care, that there are 134 definitions of integration in the literature, so well done. Um, although that was about six months ago, so it's quite probable that the, uh, the number has, has gone up. Um, um, so people think they're talking about the same thing. Very interesting, if you go to Wales and talk to them about integration, they entirely mean health and social care. They don't really talk about mental health, and they don't talk about the ologies and primary care in terms of integration. It's only about social care. So you, I spent a good hour or so listening to them talk about integration and entirely failing to understand what they mean. So when you frame your idea for service change, being clear about what that means. And so the biggest problem in, in, in framing the idea is losing sight of the patient. I, I particularly like uh, this from a, a piece of work uh, done by... Um, I think a company called Vanguard Consulting came up with this rather interesting uh, insight, which is redesigning the diabetic pathway is a totally different proposition from understanding what helps people with diabetes, uh, uh, what help people they need in their lives and what actually makes a difference to them. Um, so we're designing pathways for professionals, but uh, the best pathways obviously involve uh, patients. And then again, something that's cropping up a lot in these um, sustainability and development plans is the notion of standardisation, which seems to be in danger of being misunderstood as um, everybody doing largely the same thing. And there's a particular st uh, trick, which is if you're a high referrer, then you should come down to the lower level of everyone else as though that's the right the right thing to do. I don't know if people have come across this. By the way, it never seems that the people who are low referrers should increase their referral rate, which might be an equally plausible proposition. But the, 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 the real rule is not standardised. The real rule is design in response to variety, not just standardised streamlining control. Now, once you've done that, within the categories of variety, there's plenty of opportunity to standardise. But I think there's a sort of a, a big risk here. We see a lot in the design of these service changes, which, uh, which means that the, the patient, what the patient needs gets lost in the search for organisational tidiness, convenience um, and, and streamlining, which probably, in the end, creates more work um, and destroys, uh, destroys the value that you could be, uh, you could be creating. So, um, having framed what we're going to do, let's set some objectives. Um, and if you want to fail, set too many, like lots of objectives. Um, and make sure they're, a good tip here is make sure they're vague, because then it will mean when people like me come and evaluate it, it's very, very hard to say that you didn't achieve what you set out to do. Um, you won't have achieved it anyway, so it won't matter. Um, very common. Um, a, a very, another really common thing is trying to avoid, in setting objectives, is, is a bit of skirting around difficult issues. I don't know, those of you who've been involved in, in integration projects, I think North West London's not so prone to this, but um, in a lot of integration projects I've seen, no one's actually said to the GPs, guys, you are going to have to change the way that you practice medicine, the way that you work, and the way you run your business. Um, everyone is talking about changing these things, but no one seems to have actually 
had the difficult conversation with them that says, do you know what, a two-partner practice uh, probably is not a viable unit for you to work in if you're going to be part of this bigger system. Um, it's, quite, it's quite interesting. And the GPs who come and participate in those conversations, unsurprisingly, don't appear to necessarily want to go back and tell their colleagues that difficult message either. So we see quite a lot of skirting around uh, difficult issues. Um, another problem, which in the projects I was involved in was a real... Uh, the NHS is fantastic at writing bids for money. It's a really, I mean, actually, it's, there's, there's a lot of people who could make a career of just writing bids. The difficulty is the implementation bit seems to be a bit shaky. So you see a lot of um, projects which have been framed to appeal to an external funder, perhaps NHS England or, uh, some, uh, or, or someone else, but doesn't actually connect to uh, the people who have actually got to do the work. Um, or in fact may not even connect to the reality on the ground. It's, you know, people may have gone to see some people who have written these bids and you actually look at what they say they're doing and what they are doing and the two often don't add up. Um, come back to alarming staff by the way you set objectives in a minute. Um, and then you know, um, the objectives being technocratic, um, uh, in management speak or policy speak and failing to connect uh, to the needs of the patients. So um, onward. Uh, uh, okay, so what else do we see? Um, project, um, having a project management office may be a good idea, but it may also be a sign that your project is too complex for a human being to actually cope with. Uh, so we see a lot of very, very complex projects. Um, uh, but, but, and also uh, projects in which there is a gap in the logic between the, um, the, the, the intervention and the outcomes that are going to be achieved. So, so and that gets lost in the complexity, and the, these two, this is why these two are, are related to each other. Um, there's a, something called planning, the planning fallacy. Has anyone come across this? It's uh, Daniel Kahneman and Avon Tversky. They won the Nobel Prize for economics a few, a few years ago. The planning fallacy basically is, uh, it seems like, I don't know why you won, win a Nobel Prize for this sort of thing, but uh, basically it's the, when you plan to, do, you know, if you want to make God, people look, God laugh, show him your plans. So, you, you know, when you write a to-do list and you're going to have done all these things by lunch, that's, and, and by tea time they're still not done, that's the planning fallacy. It's sometimes called optimism bias. Yeah? It means you never achieve, you never achieve the deadlines that you set yourself. Well, not ever, but, but uh, particularly for complex projects. And these, this applies to you personally. I'm not looking at any of you in particular. Um, this is a common problem. Uh, it also applies to group projects. Um, so there's lots of examples of the planning fallacy uh, where just things, uh, just things are not, not happening. Um, Here's, here's, an, here's another uh, question, um, to which I don't think I'm, I fully know the answer, but uh, um, transformation is a very sexy thing, right? Um, and it's, it, it, we talk a lot about transformation and things like, people use words like disruption as well, as a, um, and then this terrible phrase, which I rather dislike, scale and pace, uh, partly because it reminds me of an extremely unfunny comedy duo, it were very, not, not funny at all, but um, it has a certain trips off the tongue, um, but actually, the statistics of big transformation projects would not, in, would not make you think that this is necessarily a fantastic thing to be, uh, to be getting involved in. Mary Dixon Woods, uh, in her uh, really interesting article on why, you know, on some of the problems of quality improvements at the sort of microsystem level, points out that we have a, we have a, a real risk of framing things in ways, and I make, was making this point briefly earlier, that uh, actually alarm staff and make people uh, really quite fearful about what's going to happen. Um, and that's, of course, uh, likely to mean that they're somewhat disempowered, and that, that is, in turn, is associated with, uh, with failure uh, in, in terms of managing, uh, managing change. It's also the case that complex systems are really hard to design. Uh, most of the complex systems, uh, uh, I think, given the audience we're in, we're pretty safe, I'm pretty safe to say that intelligent design uh, you know, is, is maybe nice as an idea, but, quite, uh, but evolution probably trumps it. Um, uh, complex systems tend to evolve from simple systems that work. It's very, very difficult to design a complex system. Um, that you can design complicated systems, like nuclear power stations, but designing complex systems, in other words, those that have emergent properties that emerge out of the interactions of the agents within them, uh, and therefore are fundamentally unpredictable, or, or at least um, elements of them are, are, are unpredictable, is that it makes it very, very hard 
give you, uh, there's, my, there's back to my minor injuries example. Uh, this seemed like a sensible thing, but people are, people are clever, people are smart. They work out that if it takes a, an hour on the phone uh, to get an offer of a GP appointment in a, in a week's time, or I can go three miles to a minor injuries unit and be seen in a maximum of four hours, and then they, they go there, they're seen by a very competent nurse practitioner or, or GP uh, within half an hour, they go back and tell all their friends. So you get an emergent property of people changing their behaviour in ways that are very difficult to predict. Uh, when they shut the maternity unit at, at St Albans, it was expected that all the mothers of St Albans would go to Hemel Hempstead. Anyone is an emergent property. Anyone who knows he uh, Hemel Hempstead and St Albans would think no one would be seen dead in St Albans who lives in, uh, in Hemel Hempstead who lives in St Albans. They all went to Welling Garden City. So, um, com com I don't know. I don't know what's wrong with Hemel Hempstead personally, but. Um, uh, very interesting emergent property, that, which is also related, by the way, to another failure that isn't on my list here, which is the NHS is very, very bad at geography. It's extremely bad at geography. I, I, it, um, uh, and I had to explain to the chief, now retired chief executive of one North London hospital that uh, I lived in her catchment area that uh, Edgware, and that I was not going to go to Chase Farm for my elective surgery when I was 15 minutes from the Royal Free by the Northern Line. It didn't seem to occur to her that the rest of London thought North South, and she only thought East West because uh, of, uh, she managed a hospital that was structured that way, which is uh, so bad at geography. I'll add that to the next version of these slides. Um, the, the problem with this, of course, is that evolution and, and, and experiment does have failures, and it's just is a bit failure pr uh, resistant. It doesn't, it's quite risk averse. It does, and of course, failures do, do, do have risk of, uh, evolved with them. But um, so we've been, they also take time, and many of the people who are sponsoring these projects feel that they've got uh, time at their back and, uh, and, and feel very much under pressure. So that's, a, that's, that's an issue. And I think there are some changes which is quite hard to do by incremental change. But I mean, I, my, my hypothesis is that for most of the changes that we're interested in, large numbers of small scale changes added together is likely to be transformative and more likely to succeed than a big transformation project, which in theory ought to take less time, but experience suggests often fail and has to, has to restart. So you may be better plugging away with things you can do and make change and show people that you can make things happen. It's very interesting, I think, one of the successes of the sort of small system quality improvement is when the statistical process control chart dips and you move the lines within a few weeks of you doing something, you, getting that immediate feedback is very reinforcing and, and encouraging for people. So, so, so interested in what people think there. Increment, uh, incremental change or transformation? Or actually, maybe transformation is just the sum of incremental change, and we should be uh, bolder about being incremental. It'll be paradoxical for you for a minute. <coughs> Um, I have banned my researchers from saying high quality leadership is important in the delivery of these projects because it's like obvious, right? Um, if they find at some point that high quality leadership really got in the way and held everyone back, that would be a research finding, right? But so we, 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 let's not, uh, we, we won't dwell on this, except that it is obviously important. Just a few observations here. Uh, off a standard tactic, um, if you really want to fail, give your project to the person who's really, really busy. And I keep, keep seeing that. And now I know the, the, the old adage is, if you want something done, give it to a busy person. These people have tested the limits of that and discovered uh, that uh, that's, a, that's a problem. Uh, Chief Executive says, this is the most important project we've got on at the moment, but it's totally invisible. That's, uh, uh, so they're absent. Um, and and the, the, the one you want to be really careful about when they're absent is the finance directors, because while they're off, doing, they're off doing something else that may not necessarily support the rest of the project. But, Anxiety of finance directors, given that many of the types of projects we're talking about do change the way that financial flows work, the finance directors come back to this late and get very upset and rather, rather alarmed, so getting them involved early seems important. One of the big problems that we've not really cracked is when these projects involve multi-organisational collaboration. Um, we haven't worked out how to stop people defecting from agreements that they've signed up to. It's quite tricky. Um, so we're all here for the patient, up until the point when you do the financial sums and it turns out that actually I've just lost you know, a huge chunk of income and I've got no way of recovering it. So, and then things start dropping apart. And uh, the way our governance of organisations is set up allows people to say, well, I'd love to sign up to this, but my board are not going to tolerate it. So you, you get the thing drops apart and it drops apart because somewhere we've lost sight of the patient. Um, the, uh, 
The final problem I'll just mention here is uh, what I call death by assurance. Um, I don't know, anyone been involved in the Vanguard programme? Um, but there's a sort of, that the, people are so worried that things aren't going to work that there's a lot of form filling, uh, which is just soul destroying, saps the energy. A load of boring issues, that are technical, but really are important. And, and actually, again, I've mentioned one of them, which torpedoes people is, if you don't get the financial flows right at some point, or have some arrangement for dealing with it, uh, you, you, you will run into trouble. Um, we still haven't sorted out the information governance problems, which, uh, and the, 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 the experience in a number of places have, dis made, have actually made us learn that just because you don't like the regulatory or legal framework that we're in, you can't necessarily wish it away. Um, the biggest experience of this was in uh, Cambridge with a very innovative project for caring for older people where they, the, the people running it were told again and again that, uh, uh, that they just developed a project on which they were going to have to pay VAT, 20% uh, extra, non, uh, that's a lot of money. And they kind of said, well, surely we can just negotiate with HMRC. I don't know how many of you tried to negotiate with HMRC, <laughs> but, you know, you would have thought warning lights were already... Uh, um, so, you know, um, however... Here's the thing, some of these uh, barriers are not as big as they claim to be. Um, information governance is uh, one, because um, while a lot of the, con the, the discussion of these new models of care is, uh, is all about the technical design of the governance, the finances, the job descriptions, what people do, the, the thing that unravels things the most and the, the magic ingredient that seems to turn you know, a not very exciting service delivery change into something that really works very well is the quality of the relationships and the nature of the behaviour of the people in the system. And I think we massively underestimate the significance of this, but for good, both good and bad, you know, that uh, this can also wreck it. So I'm not going to share my information with you. Information governance is a good excuse, but the real reason is I don't trust you, I don't like you, and I've never worked with you before. Right? Um, or actually, uh, you stole my boyfriend at medical school um, <laughs> 25 years ago, but you know, um, or we fell out as partners uh, in GP practice, or he was my senior registrar and I've always thought he was a jerk. You know, that type of... Um, I'm sure you've never come across that, but it does happen. Uh, it's uh, but, but so the relationships and how people behave and how they work together, um, the, the, whether you've got a history of failing to deliver in the past, whether you're really just focusing on your institution, and this is, this is a particular issue that the integration pioneers found, that when, the more you focus on resource release as your objective, uh, the more likely it is that people retreat back into their organisational silos, particularly the middle-level managers. Um, who we, we massively neglect as an important element of change here. They're the people who do most of the delivery, um, but we're holding them to account for the budgetary performance of their particular bit of the, uh, bit of the organisation. So that's, a, that's a, 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 very, a very significant risk. We've mentioned defection from common agreements. We've talked about avoiding the, 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 the multiple elephants uh, in the room. And a particular issue for the NHS is only thinking about the NHS and failing to really think about housing, social care, education, um, and uh, all of the other bits of the, uh, the system that makes things uh, work. Um, a few lessons about evaluation. They're almost a talk in itself, and there are better people to, uh, to, to, talk, to give this talk than me. But um, a common feature of evaluation is evaluating too early. So you haven't actually done it long enough to learn how to do these things. These often involve, because they're about behaviour and about changes and people changing their roles, changing how they practice, uh, changing their interprofessional relationships, changing their relationship with the patient. Uh, the patient may well be changing the way that they interact with the system. These things need to be learned, they take time, but we start the evaluation long before many of those new behaviours have properly bedded in. So when you evaluate it, lo and behold, and we've got a number of examples of this, where the control group performs better than the intervention group. Not, thank you, yes, not just, uh, uh, not just uh, the intervention, there's no difference, the intervention group does worse. Uh, by the way, that's partly because we think in a number of these things that uh, case finding finds all sorts of hidden things that we didn't know were wrong that then get investigated. So, you, but, so there's another thing happening there. But, so doing it too early, um, changing your objectives so we can't evaluate them, a uh, feature of some of the pioneers, um, uh, not too, uh, having too many of the wrong sorts of measures, and uh, we won't debate it now, but it's a really interesting question whether avoided admission is actually a good metric for many integrated care schemes. I'm, I'm not convinced that that's quite the right way of looking at, uh, at what, uh, what we're doing. Um, Overclaiming the savings. So if I save an admission, um, or I say 
say 1,500 pounds a day, or if I save a bed day, I save 250 pounds a day. No, you don't. You only save the variable costs, uh, uh, and this is we we continually go wrong. I think that my uh, well, I, I used to work with low health economists. We continually have this battle. The only costs that matter in most of these systems is your variable costs. There's no point assuming you can save the cost of the building unless someone else is going to come along and pay for it. So you've really got to think very carefully about what you're really saving and what cash you're actually releasing. Um, and I'm afraid that limits some of our options. The final thing about evaluation is many of the evaluations we look at are pilots which have, which have been purposefully chosen because they're run by really good people, like the lady I talked about earlier in her hospital home scheme. They're given extra money. Uh, they're given a load of extra support. Uh, so we, you know, we then wonder why they're hard to replicate. Um, so just be, just be, I think, a few things to think about there. So um, to bring all that together, um, very good article by a colleague of mine, um, Richard Bomer, who some of you may have come across from, was at, was at Harvard, uh, in the New England Journal of Medicine, um, which uh, talks about the, 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 the hard work of change. And this isn't quite his list, but it, I noticed after I'd done this slide, it's very, it, it's, it's very similar. So um, that, that's a, that article is available free. It's behind, not behind the New England Journal paywall. Um, so, so pulling all of the, some of these lessons together, what else do you need to make this happen? Well, the first is actually having a change method. Um, many of these projects did not have a methodology for change. So the, 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 the Deming question, by what method, is a, really important, is a really important one here. And then method's good, but you also need skills. And, and the particular people here um, are the middle managers um, and the sort of frontline clinical supervisors. Um, they need skills and improvement. They need, you need data flows to tell people what they're doing in real time, not months, uh, not months uh, later. Um, you need clinical leadership uh, underpinned by really good, uh, really good middle management. Often clinical, these people are often clinical middle managers, remember, they're not just, I'm using management generically here. Um, you need proper senior support that's really behind them and can put, come in and sort out the problems and the barriers that they're bumping into, uh, rather than just holding them to account and asking for you know, the, the standard NHS attempt to uh, keep the colour printing industry um, in business of producing red, red, green and amber uh, reports. This is about support, not, about, uh, not just about accountability. Um, a strong and clear narrative uh, and some clear priorities for people so that they know what's important. Um, and that's quite important because I think one of the lessons of these types of changes, you need probably multiple simultaneous changes happening concurrently across a wide range of activity. So someone needs to be holding those all together and also watching out for where they bump into each other, where uh, one sets of people's improvements start creating problems for, for, other, for other people. The detail really matters. Um, the NHS has been very bad at, at looking at the detail. And the sort of final sort of underlying theme of all of this is not getting lost in the, sort of the technocratic project management bit of this and, and remembering that uh, the, at the end of the day, the measure of this is the value that we add to the patient. Thank you very much. Thank you.